All right, we are back. This is lecture eight of CS164, and believe it or not, we only have a few lectures left. So today we focus on iOS and closing some holes and also introducing unit testing, which I promise, boring as testing sounds, um, it's one of those life skills that uh, definitely do as I say and not as I've done for years, because this is a very good habit to get into, but more on that in a bit. Um, next week we'll focus on matters of scalability. Um, which can be generalized not just to the iOS world, but back to the web world and such. So especially those of you who are interested in do, working for startups, doing something entrepreneurial where you yourself are going to have to figure out how many servers do I need, how do I connect them together, how many databases do I need so that you can make the next greatest thing, or even something more limited in scope. We'll talk about those issues in scaling out your own architecture when a course like this or CS50 or any other no longer just hands you the architecture you need and a username and password, but you have to figure all that stuff out for yourself. Um, in a couple weeks' time, we'll be joined by a friend of ours, Edward Guar uh, Edwin Guarin from Microsoft, who will talk about Windows Mobile development, as well as how you can make web-based apps appear to be native, thanks to libraries like something called PhoneGap. And then the last lecture, we'll come full circle and look at uh, issues of security, both related to mobile devices, native apps, web apps, and try to plug in some holes so that you can scramble and fill in any, uh, fix any mistakes that might be in your fourth and final project. So today, um, I finally finished reading through all of the mid-semester surveyed feedback and just wanted to cherry pick a few of the common themes. I um, realized that there were other topics that arose, um, and so this is not meant to diminish those, but really just to focus on some of the recurring ones. Um, so turnaround times for getting PSET feedback. Um, the head TFs and I have spoken with the team, and we will aim to turn things around even more quickly than we have thus far. Um, and do reach out to me or heads at CS164 personally if you're feeling like you're kind of in the dark as to where you stand as to uh, what you can be doing better in these projects. Um, in terms of partners, so this is a problem that was inevitable. So we talked to CS161, for instance, before the semester started as to how their historical partnerings work. Um, and Margot Seltzer, who's taught that course for many years, gave me the lowdown on statistics as to the failure rate of partnerships, not failing grades, but failed partnerships. Um, and so we kind of anticipated that we'd have you know, 10 or fewer a partner, dramatic situations, a falling out, one of them drops, one of them withdraws. So the numbers have been pretty consistent with that. But this is really just to acknowledge that these things happen. Um, the course is deliberately designed to have people working with partners, because the reality is you can do more interesting things, certainly on a larger scale that way. But these kinds of fallouts are inevitable. So do reach out to us if you haven't already, if you're having some last minute drama or whatnot, so that at least you end the semester on the highest note possible. Um, I know partners can kind of make and break courses. CX CS161 for me was amazing um, because I had a great friend um, with whom I was working on that uh, in all of its projects. So I realize it kind of can leave a sour taste if your, roommate, if your uh, partner is not pulling his or her own weight. So we'll try to accommodate um, if need be in the weeks that remain. So support. So a curious comment throughout some of the surveys was that there's not enough support in the class. And while I absolutely concurred with that a few weeks back, um, now we do have the cyclical office hours and design uh, reviews and code reviews, as well as weekly sections that are filmed, as well as walkthroughs now for the staff assigned projects. And so I can only respond in a couple of ways. One is be sure, obviously, you're availing yourself of these resources. And if you can't make it logistically that you watch the videos online or that you schedule something with us more intimately one-on-one. -on -one. Um, for those of you who just came out of 50, though, I can say that um, the course does not have the sort of nurturing environment of weekly intimate sections of just 10 or 15 people. And that's deliberately designed. Um, so if that's what was meant by support structure, that I do concede. But it's not the design of a higher level course like this. But do reach out if you're feeling that even with these new mechanisms in place, that you're not quite um, being able to succeed in the class. So also comfort levels. Um, and this, too, I think created some of the um, issues that we tried to address earlier in the semester, and frankly, some of the ones that remain. So we have a huge gap of experience levels in this course, far more than we have even something like 50, because whereas there you just have kids coming out of high school, here we have college students who are still sophomores or seniors who have interned, maybe, in the latter bucket for one or two summers. And so the just gap between less and more comfortable folks is just much wider. So in retrospect, to be honest, 
you know, I think we probably would have ratcheted up the prereqs for the course and not just had 50 be the only prerequisite and maybe expect two or three courses in computer science. Um, that's certainly too late in coming now. But just realize we're aware of this. this is the first time the course is offered. That's something we might do if the course is offered again. Um, so for now, realize we've tried to bolster the resources we have to handle the 150 disparate backgrounds that we actually have. Um, and finally, time frames. Um, this one, too, I kind of want to offer a bit of tough love. So I also concede in early on in the semester, things were a little tight. But now that there is at least a weekend for every one of the milestones, and given that each of the projects has month-long time frames effectively, I really do need to push back to some extent to say that if you're really scrambling up until the last minute to finish these things, it's really a time management issue, as much as it is high expectations for these projects. And I can only plead for this second, uh, for this first iOS project, if you're not planning to set aside a non-trivial amount of time this week, do, 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 do. Realize that most of you had some kind of web programming background earlier, but this is a very new world. It adds OOP back with a completely new language. There's a whole number of features you have to implement. You have to work with your partner. So realize this is not the sort of thing you're going to want to dive back into on you know, Saturday or Sunday, like use this week effectively. All right, um, please reach out if you have other questions or concerns. So let's uh, round out one detail here to talk about how you can actually store data persistently. So especially for the Student's Choice project, you have the ability not to make ephemeral apps that boot up, do something, and then that's it. But you can actually save state, not unlike Evil Hangman's uh, high scores or really any game or application that actually remembers data even after the phone is turned off, rebooted, and the app itself is terminated. So you can store data in an iOS app in a whole bunch of ways. Just to recap, a property list is one of the easiest ones. You're using it for project two. What is a property list, really? Yeah. It's just an XML file. It's sort of an abstraction layer on top of what underneath the hood is just an XML file. But what, can you, what kinds of uh, collections can you store in, an X, in a plist? You can do arrays and associated arrays. Yeah, arrays and associated arrays called dictionaries in the context of Objective-C. So this is nice. And what kinds of things might you typically want to store in a property list in an iOS app? Yeah, exactly. So settings, right? So the user settings. In fact, NS user default is an abstraction layer on top of a storage mechanism that allows you to store things like what's the default length of words for Evil Hangman, how many guesses do you get so that the user doesn't have to pick these all the time. Um, also, besides just user defaults or user preferences, what about when you first ship Evil Hangman and a user downloads it from the App Store and they just don't have, by definition, any preferences yet? Well, where might you store the truly default value for word length? or number of uh, uh, guesses to give the user. Well, you could hard code these in constants or sharp define in your code. But if you want that, those things to be much more easily updatable so you don't have to recompile the code and all of that, well, you could even store your default defaults, so to speak, in a property list. And there is a mechanism with NS user defaults to pre-populate it with these out-of-the-box defaults that the user can then override by actually changing those settings. So in short, it's very nice. It's relatively simple. You can debug it easily because you can literally open the thing with a text editor if you want and see what's actually inside. So what about SQLite? We've talked about SQL in probably some prior class that you've taken. SQLite is all about what? Yeah. Perfect. So it literally is a light version of a SQL database, whereby the database is just a big binary file that grows as you add tables and rows to those tables. But it still gives you the expressive capabilities of SQL. So you can do selects and inserts and deletes and joins and the like, but without the overhead of actually having to talk to a server. This is compelling in a mobile device, because you don't really have like MySQL or something running on this thing. And you don't want to probably require internet access just to talk to some remote database server. And even then, it would not be a good thing to execute raw SQL queries over an internet connection, unless everything's nicely encrypted and such. So in short, you can still use SQL, and you can still model your data and your entities and relationships and all of that, but with a smaller, uh, a lighter weight implementation of that same thing. Um, so there's XML and JSON. So realize that especially in the context of web programming or in iOS apps that talk to the network, like an instant messaging client or some game application that's multiplayer, you can talk to remote servers using mechanisms that you might remember 
over from web programming, whether it's XML or JSON. And thankfully, Apple finally added to the iOS 5 SDK native support for these kinds of things. So it's actually a lot easier now to parse XML and JSON without having to Google around and find some nice person's、uh, open source library to add to your project. So the SDK is getting better at that. And core data, which one or more of you have actually asked about or commented about on the help board. Um, realizes an abstraction layer on top of any number of mechanisms that allows you to have a storage container for storing data persistently, but you yourself don't really have to care about whether it's SQLite or just an XML file or the like. Its complexity is、um, it's more complex to implement than, say, something like. Uh, NS user defaults for actually storing data, but if you actually have complex relationships among objects, student objects and courses objects and faculty objects and the like, something like Harvard courses, core data allows you to abstract away the details of SQL and get out of the business of deciding your actual schema with as much precision and let the operating system actually manage objects for you. What does this mean? This means instead of writing a SQL query to select data,、uh, data from a database, you instead would call an Objective C method that Itself figures out how to get all of the course objects from the underlying database, whether it's SQLite or something else. So, in short, you don't need to use this for Project Two. For Project Three, you're welcome to use Core Data. And checking a box in the templates in Xcode allows you to enable Core Data relatively easily. But we would defer to any number of online references for actually wrapping your mind around the capabilities.、Um, and realize it's again just an abstraction layer that allows you long term to simplify the management of more complex. Data sets. So let's take a quick look at SQL Lite, if only because SQL is probably among the most familiar mechanisms here,、um, XML aside, and take a look at this example here. So in the SQL Lite project, PDF and source codes online, if you want to play along. We have pretty much the same application that we played with last week that allows you to create a little interface like. This in the simulator, where I had a whole bunch of words. In this case,、uh, excerpted from the project itself, and I just wanted to have a little bit of a table view. And today, the projector is a bit cleaner. You can actually see the rows in this、uh, UI table view. Well, let's see where this data is coming from and how you can use SQLite, not just to do something simple like this, but something a little more interesting. So here are my files. This is just a single view application template, so I kept it pretty simple. And most of these files, like main.m, I can pretty much ignore, though no. Notice I do have small dot SQL Lite, so I actually created this SQL Lite database offline using actually a little PHP script. Long story short, I wrote a little PHP script to open the XML file. Then I created a SQL Lite database using some PHP functionality. Now this is not necessarily the norm. You can create an empty SQL Lite with an Xcode itself, no PHP, no XML. But I just wanted to convert essentially our small dot plist file. To a SQL Lite variant, so I could include it in the project. So I just dragged it over into my supporting files. So let's take a quick look at the app delegates, because that's where the story often begins after main.m. Nothing interesting here. This is just template code, view controller, and window. Let's look at app delegate.m. All right, this too looks pretty vanilla up top. But if we start to zoom out here, we see application did finish launching with options. Nothing going on there. So now let's look at view controller.h. Really, nothing going on there. ViewController.nib. Well, this appears to be a list of cities, but really, again, this is just Xcode's depiction of what is a generic table view.、Um, so, lastly, ViewController.m. So, let's see what's inside of here. So, notice a couple of things. I seem to have included this header file so that I can actually invoke various SQLite methods, some of which might look familiar if you've used this in some other language.、Um, let's come back to this in just a little bit. Uh, and down here, synthesize words. What is that? Well, words is apparently referring to this property. I'm not sure why it's in my m file instead of .h. So we'll come back to that in a moment. But here's the synthesize for it, and here's the guts of this program. In it with nib name bundle. So when is this method called? And by whom? By the app delegate. So recall that the app get delegate has that application did launch, did finish launching with options, and among the things it does is this line here. This is just boilerplate from the template, so you get this for free. And recall that the thing it's calling is view controller alloc, and then calling on that object in it with nib name view controller. So the app delegate. Creates a view controller object and then effectively loads into it the contents of the nib file, so that ni- so that the view controller has a view that it can present to the user. So this method, we're overriding. Why? 
So now I'm back in viewcontroller.m. Why am I implementing this method, which feels like it's some system level initialization method? All right, step back. What does it mean to override a method? A little sanity check. Carl. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So in the context of object-oriented programming, where you typically have a hierarchy of objects, and we do in this case, the class is called ViewController, 